How many of you know that over every region on the face of the earth, there are prevailing spirits? Should I explain that? There are, when Paul was writing in 1 Timothy chapter 2, he said we should pray for leaders and all of that. What happens is this, because we travel a bit, whenever I go to a territory, I can discern the spirit that is prevailing in that place. Should I tell you how I do it? By looking at the way people are thinking. When I see the way they are thinking, I know the spirit prevailing. Why? Because first, 2 Corinthians 10 says, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of our warfare are what? Not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down what? Imaginations and what? Every high thing and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So with my understanding of that scripture, I have the ability to look at the situation and see what people's minds are thinking like and I can discern this is the spirit operating here. Why am I telling you this? Because you can discern what is at work in you, you can discern what's at work around you. If a brother has lost in him and he goes to a red district territory, what do you think will happen? Intensive loss will be at work. Is that not true? Why? Because that is what is prevailing in that place. So if he is smart and he has identified it here, he can identify it there. Now, what does that tell you? You can have your battle, your, your weapon of warfare on one hand and your building plow on the other hand. Are you seeing what I'm saying here? Now, I wrote an article for some ministers I mentor. I called it Dealing with the Beast of the Land. And then the summary of that article is this. I wrote it some time ago, maybe a few months, a few weeks, I can't remember now. But the, 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 the essence of that article is this, that when you come into a territory and you see the spirit, you, you perceive, descend, whatever the spirit's going on, you cultivate a lifestyle that stops the influence of that prevailing spirit from entering you. Did you catch that, somebody? How many of you know that you can stop some things from affecting you? You can do exactly opposite of what that thing demands just to stop it. I remember years ago, we went to Kenya, 1992. I can't remember all the details now, but when we came into Kenya, I was able to discern the prevailing strongholds in that nation. And I began to preach against them, one after the other. Somebody who went with me, listen to this, listen to those messages, received them, and he came back two years later, and it formed a ministry born out of the things that he heard me say by the prevailing spirit. And in a period of five years, he planted almost 20 churches in Kenya. Now, don't say it was because of only what he heard from me. He had grace too. But the point I'm making is this. Every time they started their service, they'll say, this is what we're here for. And they will identify the things. Unfortunately, the brother has had problems. And one of the things we identified were the things that knocked him off. To show you that these things are real. Is, is somebody hearing me here? So what I'm trying to let you understand is this. The first thing you need to learn to do, as you learn to grow, these are things I'm learning, lessons in maturity. You learn to say, okay, these prevailing spirits, none of them will have any part in my life. You know how you cultivate that? By the thoughts you permit, by the words you think, and by the actions you take. You will not yield in your lifestyle to prevailing spirits. Is somebody hearing me? <laughs> You will not yield in your lifestyle. If I come into a prevailing spirit of poverty, I'll be most generous. I will not allow myself to think lack. I will refuse it. Even when there is no money, I'll be speaking my faith. Am I hearing somebody say amen? You must understand that because that's part of what we have as believers. That's part of what I learned as I was growing up. When we came into this country, there were some prevailing spirits. How many of you know there are prevailing spirits here? One of them is spirit of independence. Talk to me. And every spirit has a justification for being where they are. Don't you think prevailing spirits just happen by accident? No. They are, they are there for God knows what reason, but they have dominated people, and people think and talk and act in ways that are in incongruence with the prevailing spirit. That's why they are called principalities and powers. In this place... Authority structures are not strong. It's true or false. Why? Maybe because of abuse of authority like we learned in prayer today. 
Maybe because of something in the past, but it's there. What does that do? It makes discipleship difficult. So what do I do? I don't let it dominate me, but at the same time I respect it that others are under it. So I don't try to impose anything on anybody. Say amen. But if anybody wants to break out of it, you can. Say amen. You can. You can say, you know what? I know there's a prevailing spirit, but I'm not going to let it control me. What about immorality? Is it prevailing? Breaking of homes? Is it prevailing? But these are ingred- the ingredients that are there. They are things that the demonics are playing on. They are playing on the minds of people. What about the spirit of fear in this land? Is it prominent? I mean, you, 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 you. Is there anything you do without fear in this land? Think about it. Is there anything? Almost nothing. You're afraid, of, you're afraid of sickness, you're afraid of death, you're afraid of recession or economy, you're afraid you don't have enough money, you're afraid of tax paying, you're afraid of... They're now quiet on me now. Is it true? Well, God has not given you the spirit of fear, Amen. but of power, of love, and of a sound mind. Amen. How many people know that many believers are afraid to stand as believers in this land by the way, when we first started coming to this country, I, we observed, my wife and I, that anybody who wanted to stand out for God suddenly fell sick. Yep. They, they used to call it um, backlash. So what do you think that was sending to the people who were not standing for God? Don't try it. Yeah. Otherwise, the backlash will come. And the spirit of fear was hanging there. But thank God that we came and we backlashed the backlash. Say, Lord, amen. We did. We said, no. You're not going to backlash nobody here. Am I talking here? You see, there are many things that are accepted, but when you look at it closely from the Word of God, it's a contradiction. And if you don't know how to war against it, it'll dominate you. Am I talking here? But whether we allow ourselves to be dominated by the prevailing mindset is another matter. That's where strength comes from. That's the whole essence of knowing these things. Now, I'm not saying be adamant and not let God mold you. I'm saying don't allow prevailing spirits to dominate you. Is somebody hearing me here? I, I don't discard them just because they are prevailing. I investigate them. I look into them. What is this about? Why did it come? What are they trying to say? I study it. I learn my lessons from it, but I don't let it dominate me. Are you getting my point here? I don't let it dominate me. This, the climate of lack of money will not make me be afraid that God can supply my needs. Did you hear me, somebody? And let me even hit the nail on the head for you. Do you know why giving is a major part of the gospel? Shall I tell you? It's one of the things I learned early as a Christian. You see, God ordained that your seeds will determine your future. Shall I say that one more time? Let me say it again. God ordained that your seeds will determine the harvest of your future. Did you hear that? And Jesus said that where your heart is, there your treasure will be. And he was talking about money. He said, lay up your treasures in heaven where moth and wrath and thieves do not come. How do you lay up your treasure in heaven? By giving. Now watch. When I got called into ministry, part of my deal with God, what my understanding was this, that if you can have a pure ministry where my people can give into, I will return a hundredfold to them. That's why from the foundation of this ministry, we laid it on doing what was right, never taking advantage of anybody. We didn't just start it here, we started from back in Nigeria. Is somebody hearing me? So that's why I believe in giving. Can I hear a loud amen? Amen. Jesus said, if you give to the poor, you lend to the Lord. So the return is as you give. But if you give for the gospel, you get a hundredfold. (laughs) So I learned to give for the gospel because I want a hundredfold. I'm smart, man. So I just want you to know that the essence of giving is not just so that you can give as if you're giving to the poor. It's you're giving to the Lord. It does some things in you. It puts your heart with God. Your treasure is given to God. Now listen to me. God will make sure he meets your needs when you do it in faith. A lot of people don't learn that. They just learn the act of giving, not the act of 
faith releasing when they give. Is somebody hearing me here? Listen, my brother, my sister, we started back in Canada where there was nothing. And if you want to know one of the secrets, apart from diligence, integrity, and all that, it's giving. Till now, giving. Hello, somebody. I mean, heaven and earth will pass away. Not one word of God will go on. God will have to raise help. If he had to send Elijah a bird, that, a raven that brought flesh to him, God will send help out of anywhere to meet the need of somebody who has planted. Amen. I want you to believe that with all your heart. It will set you free. Now, don't get me wrong. I know about the abuses that have gone on. Well, I'm aware of them. But I cannot say because of the abuse that I will take away the truth. And say because somebody's abused the truth, you know. Somebody used a car to kill somebody, so let's not drive again. Or somebody used a knife to stab somebody, so we're not going to use knife to cut me to the home again. No, we're going to use it for the right purpose. Amen. I said we're going to use it for the right purpose. Amen. The fact that somebody abuses something doesn't make it anything. It just makes sure that we've learned how not to abuse it so we can do it for the right purpose. Listen, my brother, my sister, have you ever noticed... This one secret that will help you. If you see anybody that evil trails, the chances that the person has sown evil seeds is very high. Did you hear me, somebody? I'm still talking about the lessons we're learning in, on the march to maturity. What happens is this. When you are planting your seed, nobody knows. But when the harvest comes, everybody now knows. Then they say, why is God letting it happen? Shall I give you a secret? Words, thoughts, actions, they are seeds. When you plant them, no noise is made. But when the harvest comes, you know, what happens is this. You will do something that does not warrant something. Then the whole harvest comes at that point. So you mean this small thing I did? See what happened? See what happened? No. Harvest time came. All the seeds you've been planting came to roost. Am I talking here? That's why the person who is crooked in many areas of their life, you are crooked here, nobody there, nobody saw you. You are crooked here, nobody saw you. You will just do something stupid one day. And it will look as if all of hell was broken loose on you. If you are sincere with yourself, you can see the seeds you've been planting. What if you were planting the right seeds? Talk to me. What if you were busy planting the right seeds when nobody is celebrating you? Then one day you just plant one small seed. And you look as if the whole of the harvest came. And you look as if, wow, see what God has done for them. Ooh, God is partial. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. Bible says you will be sowing your seed weeping. But you will come back rejoicing when the harvest comes. Do you know that if you understand the seed principle, even your time in church is a seed. <laughs> People have no idea what seed means, man. You see, and uh, you know, this is how it works. In the natural, the seed works whether you know it or not. In the spiritual, the seed works, especially when you put faith behind it. Even when you don't put it, it will still work. But when you put faith, it works faster and better. Are you getting anything out of this? So we want to understand seeds and how they work. So today, we're just going to be rounding it up. Amen? You know, when I was talking on Sunday, I said, and ever God deals with the hearts of men of old, they did what? They raised an altar. Remember me saying that? Today's word will be consecration. Whenever God reveals something to you, you consecrate yourself at the point of what God has said and say, you know what? From this day forward, I'm going to obey this. Say amen. When God dealt with my heart about the motive for ministry not being money, I made up my mind that I'll never mount a pulpit, no matter where, on the face of God's green earth, with the consideration of money. In other words, I will not send to somebody who invites me, how much are you going to give me? I want you to give me this amount. I will never do that. Why? My personal consecration. When he dealt with my heart concerning my motivation for ministry, I'll never do it. So if I go there and they give me any amount, that's fine. Hello. Do I know ministers who do that? Yes. Am I against them? It's none of my business. I am not called to judge others and be their God. If God has led them that way, fine. The way he has led me is that he told me never mount the pulpit. 
is the consideration of money. And that's my consecration. Say amen. Will I love for them to give me more? Yes. Or will I use that as a basis? No. Who will I talk to when I want money? The one who sent me. Are you catching it now? So your personal consecration might mean something about you that does not concern anybody else. Am I talking here? God might want to deal with your heart concerning an issue. Don't try imposing that on everybody. I'm making it look like if everybody else doesn't do it, then they are wrong. No, you just do it because God told you to. Say amen. It can, it can mean anything. All right. Your quality of life is determined by the quality of the decisions you make. Your quality of life is determined by what? Quality of the decisions you make. What does that mean? It simply means that there are different levels of thinking. Is that not true? The level of envy, jealousy, selfishness, they are very low. But the level of love and all of that, they are higher. Is that not true? That's why when Jesus was talking in John 12, he said anyone who loses his lower life, will gain it in eternal life. So there's a lower life, there's an eternal life. So the quality of life, decisions you make will determine the quality of the life you live. What does that mean? It means the quality of information you get will determine the quality of life you make. The quality of decisions you make will determine the quality of life you live. Say loud, amen. And when it comes to the things of God, God gives you the freedom to choose what level of life you want. Some people are selfish, so they look for things that will profit them immediately. Some people are generous, they look for another level of life. If you want to be a blessing, you enter a new level. If you want to take advantage of others, you are at a lower level. If you want to use the earthly wisdom, you are at a lower level. If you want to use heavenly wisdom, you are at a higher level. So what should you do? Take, make up your mind to make the decisions at a higher level. Things to engage in, seed sowing. Bless others, never seeking advantage of anyone. Do good always. As long as much lies within you, be a blessing. Then the final word, have positive expectations in life.